So as I said, if you weren't here uh, last week, Daniel is the book we're going to be kind of doing a deep dive into over the summer. We started naturally in Daniel 1, and this morning we'll be covering Daniel chapter 2. But I shared last week an overarching message of Daniel. So even though it was part of Daniel chapter 1, it is an overarching message from Daniel 1 to Daniel chapter 12 that Daniel is trying to get across to us. So even within what I read in Daniel chapter 2, you should keep this message in mind. So even as we go through the book of Daniel, if you forget everything else, you need to remember this message that Daniel 1 was emphasizing and that through everything Daniel's actually saying, he is emphasizing from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 12. And that was a statement that was made last week that goes like this. In spite of present circumstances that make it appear as if evil is winning the day, Daniel reminds us that God will reign supreme and will have the final victory. So Daniel 1 through 12 is trying to give us that message in different ways. Different things are going on, but Daniel wants to make sure that whoever is reading this, and many Jews would have been reading this in exile, like Daniel would have been, people that were living not in their home, trying to remember the promises God made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their forefathers and ancestors and all these wonderful things and living in a way that they never believed they would. And how can we find hope? And so the book of Daniel is trying to give them that message. And I, last week, kind of related that to us. That the book of Daniel is giving us that message in the same way because we experience these same things that Daniel's people experienced the circumstances that we face and the mounting uh, news reports in our world and, and not just COVID, but other things happening in the United States, we might begin to think that evil's going to win the day. And I reminded us of the spiritual battle we're in. And the hope that Daniel offers is, no, that's not how it works. God will reign supreme and have the final final victory. So that is the ongoing theme, the overarching theme of the book of Daniel. But we're going to focus in on Daniel chapter 2 this morning, where Daniel is going to be talking about a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. That's, we were introduced to him last week. King Nebuchadnezzar rules the Babylonian Empire. And so the, the point of my sermon title is how to live in an empire. That's what Daniel was trying to figure out. And while I said we don't use the word empire to talk about America, we are living uh, in what is like an empire in that America's influence is all over the world. America being one of those superpowers, you and I living in this different kingdom, and every Christian, doesn't matter what country they live in, are living in these two different kingdoms, the kingdom of God and whatever kingdom they find themselves in. We currently find ourselves in, our context is America. And so we're going to talk about this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. Daniel's going to interpret that dream, and dreams are going to become an important feature of Daniel much later, chapter 7 through 12, but it is an important feature in chapter 2. And we're going to talk about what that dream actually means and then how that dream relates to us today. So I'm going to read Daniel chapter 2, but as I'm reading that, I'm going to try and just explain what's going on so you don't get lost in the story of what's happening. Because when we think about dreams, uh, we kind of just disregard those dreams in Daniel's day and really all over the ancient Near Eastern world. And even today, actually, many cultures place a high emphasis on dreams. So sometimes it's hard for us living in North America, living in the United States, to really put a lot of emphasis on dreams because dreams can be really weird. And it's like, well, that can't mean anything. Did any of you have a dream last night? You had a dream last night. Do you remember what you dreamt? No? You just know you dreamt? Was your, can you share your dream, Hannah? <laughs> okay. Sounds inappropriate. It's church. We're not going to share that here at church. I don't, know. I don't know what you dreamt. I had two dreams this past week. One of them, I was playing soccer. 
It wasn't with like the high school team I played with or the guys in the Navy I played with. I don't actually remember who all was there. Some of them weren't very good because I remember kind of yelling at them. Uh, but in my dream, I went to kick the ball and I actually kicked Jess in bed. <laughs> she, she woke up. I don't know if you said Al or not, but I said, sorry. <laughs> But I actually dreamt that, and I kicked. I don't know if you've ever done that, where you've been dreaming something, and you like twitch or something, or you feel like you're falling, and you actually move. That happens to me fairly often. And unfortunately, Jess is starting to wear headgear and shoulder pads and stuff because I'm flailing around. The other dream I had was the last week or so, two weeks maybe, if I'm sitting on my back patio and I look this way, there's a, the cornfield and some hay or something, the other uh, thing that farmers grow in, some grass, high grass or whatever, but I've been seeing a doe and two fawn in the field. And if I'm sitting on my patio, they actually are coming to the edge of the cornfield in my grass. And I watched them for like, you know, five, ten minutes one day as they were just hanging around the edge of the cornfield and then went into the corn. So this week I actually dreamt, I didn't tell Jess this because she has nightmares about deer, so she's has a paranoia about deer, but I dreamt about this fawn coming up to my patio and me actually getting really close to it, trying to feed it, and I'm talking to it, and I'm trying to remember, I think like the fawn started talking back to me. I think in my dream, we were actually conversing, and then it kind of ran away, and I chased it, and I didn't catch it or anything. I must have woke up, but so can you guys make sense of any of that? I've also had a recurring dream that it's a Sunday morning, you guys are all here, I am late, I'm rolling out of bed, I run down here, and I've done nothing in preparation, and you're all kind of just staring at me like, what, what's he going to say up there? Or I'm thinking, what, what in the world am I going to say? <laughs> what's that, John? <laughs> that wasn't a dream. Yeah. So maybe you've had some weird dreams. I know Jess has a recurring dream where she's back at high school, at her locker or something like that, different people there. But dreams can also be really weird, like I'm talking to the fawn, and then, you know, I invite the fawn to play cards, and it's me and the fawn, my third grade teacher, and Abraham Lincoln, and we're playing cards, and dreams can do that. And we're like, that means nothing. We, we have no clue what any of that means. So we just eh, disregard all of that. Well, if you were living in Daniel's day... There would be a whole group of people that once I told that dream to, they'd be trying to figure out what that means. Because the gods are trying to tell us something through dreams. And all over the ancient Near Eastern world, not just in the Bible, but in the ancient Near Eastern world, that was what kings tried to do. Emperors, people in power. Because it was believed that the gods spoke through some kind of supernatural phenomena. So instead of the storm just being that, some meteorological event that took place, we can explain that. We took on the Weather Channel, and 24-7, you can learn about the weather, and all about the weather. In Daniel's day, that weather was actually the gods trying to communicate to human beings. And so you had a group of people whose job it was to figure out what they're saying and then tell that to whoever was in charge. The king, if you remember Joseph back in Genesis, the Pharaoh, whoever. So that's what Daniel's doing here with this dream. And what we're going to find out, we talked about this last week, is that Daniel's going to be trying to tell the king the interpretation. Well, he does tell him the interpretation as coming from his God. And, and last week we talked about when Israel was you know, raised to the ground and all these exiles went to Babylon... Daniel 1 is really introducing us to this ongoing battle. The gods of Babylon versus the God of Israel. And we could change that to be the gods of any age. I mean, we don't have statues necessarily that we worship. There are gods that people worship today, not the one true God. One of them being money, power, fame. That's, that's pretty easy to see in our American culture, where we, we've made, created shows off of idols, American Idol, to idolize them. I'm not saying you shouldn't watch that show, but that's what we're doing with people. So we've got gods of every age. In Daniel's story, it was the gods of Babylon versus the gods of Israel. And these two cultures were clashing. 
in Daniel in chapter 1, was kind of showing how he's going to try and remain steadfast to the God that he serves, the God of Israel, Yahweh. And so we're going we're gonna to see kind of round one of the gods of, of Babylon versus the God of Israel. We're going to see who wins round one. And that round takes shape in the form of a dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And remember, dreams are messages from the divine realm. They don't discount dreams. In fact, dreams are more important than almost anything else. And really, only in our, not only in our culture, but in the Western world, like North America, Western Europe, we've really divorced our thinking from the supernatural realm. So there's a lot of people that don't believe in Jesus, that don't believe the Bible is true, because of miracles. Because miracles are supernatural phenomena. There is no way that Jesus can just say something, and this dude that was blind now see. That just doesn't happen. It's supernatural. It can't be explained with our experience. It can't be explained through the senses. I can't see, taste, touch, smell it. I can't put it in a laboratory and put it through some kind of formula and come out with a solution, run experiments on it. That's what supernatural is. It's a not a natural phenomenon. So while we kind of divorced ourselves from the supernatural, many people in the world, many religions, not just Christianity, put a high emphasis on the supernatural. So if you are in Hinduism, you are trying to get in touch with the divine realm because in that realm, beyond the natural, you can learn something, some revelation about life, about existence, about whatever. You are trying to get in touch with the gods or this supernatural realm to learn something. So while we kind of here in America have divorced ourselves from explaining anything with supernatural terms, many religions and people groups all over the planet still would not just discount a dream. They think that the divine realm is coming in contact with the natural realm. And in Daniel's day, it was through a dream. And so there was a whole series of things you would do. And if you remember last week, we were talking about the training that Daniel and his buddies went through. Three years of training to do this, to take a dream, decipher it, and learn the language of the gods, and then to tell the king or whoever what that means. So there was a whole methodology to doing this. These were the uh, political leaders of the day of the Babylon. They were in the royal court. The king really didn't make decisions without consulting his wise men. That's the term that they're used there. Because once he's consulted them, he's got, okay, does the god of war want me to go and do this battle? Well, let's see what they have to say. And then they do these series of things and say, well, here's what we believe the god is saying. And so Daniel and his buddies had to get trained in divination. How do we speak the language of the gods? When he tells us a dream, we got to tell him what that dream is. And then we do that. And so they took three years of training to do all that. So that's what we're introduced to in, in Daniel chapter 2. And there's a couple of key points of what we see happening with this story to remind us of something. But then what we see Daniel doing to help us be encouraged that we probably or could be or should be doing the same thing that Daniel is. So we're going to put those two things together, but first we have to hear the story about Daniel chapter 2. And like I said, I'm going to stop at different points just to try and explain what's going on so you don't get lost. Try to stick with me. I know it's hot in here. I'm almost falling asleep myself, so I'm sweating and feel disgusting, but we're going we're gonna to push through here. So you're going to hear the story first. Again, dreams are very important. This is the job, these wise men coming. They spent their lives doing this. This is their livelihood. They got pretty much power in this empire of Babylon because they're the ones consulting the king. So Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, if you have your Bible, you can follow along. In the, year, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams that troubled his mind. And he couldn't sleep. Maybe you've had one of those dreams. We call them nightmares. It actually wakes you up 
and you can't fall back asleep. And, you know, we just discount that. Here, Nebuchadnezzar says, something is going on. I can't sleep. So this king of this gigantic empire does what most kings in his day would have done. Verse 2 says, So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. And then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to them, to the astrologers, the wise men he gathered, this is what I have firmly decided. If you don't tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will cut you into pieces and your house turn into piles of rubble. rubble. Hey, no pressure here, but if you don't uh, tell me what the dream is, guess what's coming? But, he said, if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive gifts from me and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. This is an everyday occurrence in the, in the kingdom of the empire of Babylon and any other empire in Daniel's day. The king has a dream, and, and if you want to relate it back to Pharaoh, this is a lot of similarities between Genesis and Joseph telling Pharaoh his dreams and the stuff happening there. You have a dream, and the next thing you do is you call in the magicians, the astrologers, the enchanters, and the sorcerers. These are the people trained to listen to the dream and then tell you what it means. So he just did the natural thing. Dream, bad dream, got to figure out what it means, call all the wise men to come in, and they, the king tells them the dream, and then they interpret it. The problem is, this time the king says, I'm not going to tell you what my dream is. You tell me what I've dreamed, and then interpret it. Seems like a pretty impossible task. However, if you don't do that, I'm going to just, you know, cut you to pieces and your houses will be rubble and, you know, that, that'll be the end of you. So this seems like a pretty uh, unrealistic request that the king has. But scholars aren't sure why he requested what he did. Uh, maybe he figured out if you were, if you were a smart sorcerer, you would listen to the king's dream, and then you might tell the king what he wanted to hear. Or you would try and interpret in such ways that you make sure you ended up on the good side of the king at the end of this whole interpretation thing. And so maybe the king is like, I know these guys are a bunch of charlatans. I know they're just trying to pull the wool over my eyes. So to make sure, because this dream really bothered me, to make sure I'm getting the legit story here, you tell me what I dreamed. If you can do that, then I'll believe what you had to say. Or, we're not sure if the king was like, he, had to, he was sick of these guys, because Daniel and his buddies aren't with this group, we're not sure why, but he was sick of these guys, and like, what's an easy way to get rid of these guys? Okay, you come in, I give you some kind of ridiculous request, and then I just, you know, get rid of you. That was pretty common in empires, with dictatorial rule. So whatever the case may be, he tells all of these guys trained their whole lives living in this thing in the royal court, you tell me my dream, and then you interpret it. So they said, obviously, verse 7, once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. So, okay, just tell us the dream and we'll tell you what it is. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal to the king, no one can re reveal it to the king except the gods, and they don't live among humans. Now that's going to become important from what they said here in terms of round one with the king 
with the gods of Babylon and the God of Israel. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they don't live among humans. So that response made the king angry and furious, so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So he was so mad at them, he just said, kill them all. So the decree, he was a nice guy, Nebuchadnezzar. You'll realize that as we go through this. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death because they're in this group. They've been trained. They're part of these wise men who advised the king. So any of those guys, the decree was, you're done for, you're being put to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, the guy sent out to do all the, the dirty work for the king, had gone out to put to death to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret for him the dream that he had. So Daniel, who we see in chapter 1, is 10 times better, and his buddies are 10 times better, that's what Scripture tells us, than all these other wise men in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's court. He goes in, for whatever reason, he's not in the first group. He goes in to the king and says, hey, give us some time and we'll interpret your dream for you. And so the king, for whatever reason, he was angry, you know, a second ago, but who knows, maybe Daniel had some favor with him. And the king said, all right, I'll give you some time. So then Daniel returns in verse 17 to his house and he explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be the name of, of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seizes, seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, God, of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So now there was this central conflict taking place. The king wanted this done, his dream interpreted, his wise men couldn't do it. And so the central conflict that is happening right now is who possesses this wisdom and power and who has access to it? Apparently, the gods of Babylon don't. The wise men who represented those gods and deciphered what those gods were saying to everybody, they can't do it for Pharaoh, or they can't do it for Nebuchadnezzar. So the question is, where does it come from? Where does this wisdom come from that can make sense of the world in which we live? That's what Daniel's trying to do. This wisdom that is the, the language, the, the actual uh, would be Aramaic word, it's not actually... Daniel chapter 2 begins Aramaic. It starts in Hebrew, goes to Aramaic, goes back to Hebrew. So this Aramaic word for wisdom is not like what we think of with the book of Proverbs. When we read about Proverbs and those maxims of life and idioms and things like that, this wisdom that Daniel's referring to is actually talking about revelation. Where does this stuff come from that can only come from one place where the sorcerers say, well, that comes from the gods of Babylon. Apparently, God of Israel, Yahweh, has given Daniel some revelation that cannot be obtained anywhere else. You can't find it in a book and all the stuff you learned, those three years of training, by just looking at the storm that just happened. This revelation is coming directly from God. And that's what Daniel's saying here. That God gives his people revelation to make sense of the world around us. So 
to me, this speaks volumes as a pastor who stands up in front of you every Sunday and tries to read what we say is God's Word and hear fresh from God for our day and age. So what I pray for every week is, is that, is revelation. Give me wisdom, God, not just wisdom to, you know, make the right decision in life. You know, I should save money for a rainy day. That's a wise thing to do. That's not what we're talking about. Help me understand. Give me wisdom into what you are saying, God, because this was written a long time ago to Daniel, to a lot of people that we don't even think about. And I'm trying to tell a bunch of people in 21st century Pennsylvania in 2020 what you're trying to say to us. That's what Daniel's praying for. And apparently, the God of Israel doesn't matter if he's in Jerusalem, doesn't matter if he's in Babylon, location doesn't matter. Daniel has access to his God. And it reminds us of what the sorcerers and enchanters and diviners and astrologers said. They said, no one can do this. No one can reveal to the king except the gods, and they don't live among humans. Well, we're about to find out that that isn't necessarily true. The God of Israel is accessible no matter where we are. Our God is accessible no matter where we are as followers of Jesus. Wisdom about our world comes from him. And before you think you're smarter than him, Daniel is saying we, sh we should recognize where power and wisdom come from. And he, he's about to tell Nebuchadnezzar this. But let me just make a point about that because of the current experience that you and I find ourselves in. Nebuchadnezzar, was a, he ruled the earth at this time. Whatever he said went. You didn't live in the world at this point and not be in some way subject or terrified of this emperor. He could do anything he wanted. And it reminds me of how we are as human beings. All the way back in Genesis chapter 11, when human beings tried to build the Tower of Babel, and basically the story is describing humans putting themselves in the place of God and saying to themselves, we can do anything we put our minds to. And then God scatters them all over the earth. You and I live in a day where many people in the context we find ourselves in think if we just put our minds to something, we can do anything. If we just have enough education, if we have enough money, if we have enough power, we can do anything we want to. We can build things that can do just about anything. I just watched a new commercial for the Apple Watch. And it, the commercial starts out, maybe you've seen this. It says, watch it, this watch can tell time. And then the whole commercial is talking about how many crazy things this watch can do. It's a watch. It can talk to a satellite and send a signal back, and it kind of just goes through this whole thing. This, no, not this, I don't own an Apple Watch, but this does tell time, and it tells me the date. Two things, it's amazing. We can, do, we can build a watch that can talk to satellites orbiting in space somewhere. We can do anything. And we found out in March that we can't do anything. And a virus, something microscopic, actually shut down the world. The world was shut down. The entire globe, not just, you know, the state not just our town, not just our country, the entire world was shut down. And as wise as we thought we were, we had to put the brakes on and say, wait a second, maybe we don't have all this figured out. And even March till now, there's all kinds of argu arguments about everything related to COVID. How masks work or don't work, what you can take, what you can't take, whether this vaccine is going to work or that vaccine is going to work. 
you turn on the TV and this doctor's saying one thing, that guy in a white coat saying another thing, this guy in the white coat saying another thing. We're confused. This little thing completely stopped us in our tracks. In a very real way, we were reminded of what Daniel is about to remind Nebuchadnezzar of. Bad things happen when we put ourselves in the place of God. When we don't need God anymore, we just need our science in laboratories. And unfortunately, those aren't giving us the solutions that everybody is longing for. There's still a lot of terrified people about this virus. And there's still a lot of things we don't know about it. And in a very real way in our world today, we're reminded of something that was as old as Daniel's day. When human beings put themselves in the place of God, bad things can happen. And we're going to see that in the rest of Daniel. And we're experiencing that in some ways in our own world right now. But Daniel is letting Nebuchadnezzar know that there is a God who lives among humans. And he's represented in me and my buddies. And Daniel lets the, the, the king know that by interpreting his dream. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon. I'm in verse 24, and said to him, Do not ex execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. And Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar. Remember, Daniel got a Babylonian name to identify as the Babylonians. Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And Daniel replied, He stands with all the wise men, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the magicians, all those guys. And he says, Nope, there is no enchanter, no magician, no diviner that can explain the king, to the king the mystery he asked about. Those guys that you wanted to kill earlier, they are exactly right. There is no one alive who can do that. But, verse 28, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were laying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mystery showed you what's going to happen. And Daniel says, just so you know where that mystery came from and how I'm able to tell you it, but there is a God who can reveal that to you. And verse 30 says, as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation, that you may understand what went through your mind. So you're going to know where wisdom and power and knowledge and understanding come from, I'm, I'm going to tell you that dream. And this is so that you know round one is about to be won by the God of Israel. Because maybe the king of Babylon thinks his gods run round, round one. Because Israel's God couldn't protect them. I destroyed the temple. They're all living here. But so you know who actually won round one, I'm going to tell you what your dream is. And here it is. Your majesty looked, and before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. So now image the picture of the statue. There's a statue that's standing there. The top is gold. And as you go down, each metal gets less precious, gold being the most precious. Each metal gets less precious, and the bottom being the strongest of the metals, iron. That's the statue. That's what he's dreaming about. And then in verse 35, it says, no, I wasn't there. It struck the, oh, the, 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 the rewind. While you were watching, the statue, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay, and it smashed them. 
and then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold, they were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the entire earth. That's the weird dream that Nebuchadnezzar just had that Daniel is interpreting. And so I'm about to read for you what Daniel says that means, and there's been a lot of ink spilled over what we all think that that dream means. And I want to highlight what I think the overarching message of that dream is. But something important that Daniel points out here to King Nebuchadnezzar in this dream. So what I'm about to read in the explanation of it, don't lose sight of this truth of what uh, Daniel is saying to King Nebuchadnezzar. The message of the dream, regardless of how we interpret all those medals and what's happening with the big rock and all that kind of stuff, the message of this dream is telling Nebuchadnezzar human kingdoms, no matter how impressive they are, will ultimately be overtaken and destroyed by God's everlasting kingdom. That is why Daniel says, towards the end of that, this, this rock, not sown by human, it's not some human thing, it's supernatural. This rock comes and it smashes the, the statue to pieces, and the statue's like chaff. So if you don't know what chaff is, it's the stuff that protects the grain of wheat. So at the harvest, you cut the wheat down, you put it on a threshing floor, and then you'd walk over it. They'd have like this stone that they, they crush the chaff and the wind would blow because you did it on a, a, where the wind would come. The wind would blow and the chaff would disappear. And all that would be left is the grain. He's comparing these human kingdoms to chaff. It's worthless. All it does is protect that, gla- that grain. It's worthless and it's useless and the wind can just blow it away. And Daniel says, that is what human kingdoms are like. As impressive as any human kingdom, whether it's Babylon or you name the kingdom afterwards or the empire afterwards, they're all like chaff. The wind comes and they're gone. And if you are someone who studies history, you can read about all those empires that come and go like chaff. And so Daniel is putting Nebuchadnezzar on notice here. You think your kingdom, your empire is pretty impressive. But this supernatural rock is going to come and smash it to pieces. And what we've realized is human kingdoms are like that chaff. All it takes is a little gust of wind and they're gone. And now we just read about them in history books. Daniel says this was the dream... So he tells him his dream in verse 36, and I'm going to interpret it for the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory in your hands. So where does your power, might, and glory come from? The God of heaven, my God, the God of Israel, the one that you think you bested, has given you dominion, power, and might and glory in your hands and placed all mankind the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky, wherever they live, he has made you ruler all over them. You are that head of gold. That's basically saying your empire, everything it touches, it rules. But that power, that might, that glory comes from one place. Don't ever forget it. After you, he says, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom. One of bronze will rule over the earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly baked of clay and partly of iron, so this will be the divided kingdom. I was just explaining what these other kingdoms are going to look like. Yet it will have some of its strength because it's iron. And even as you saw iron mixed with clay, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom is going to be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with bay clay, so people will be a mixture and will not remain united, 
any more than iron mixes with clay. So he's just talking about kingdoms. And as I said, there's a lot of people that have spilled a lot of ink over what they think that means. Many of them thinking that that last kingdom that he's talking about, iron that mixes with clay, is referring to Alexander the Great and the Greeks and his basically running ramshod over the entire earth. That's less important. Whatever that kingdom means, that's less important because maybe we can argue that there were even greater empires. You know, and we read about the British Empire, and, we, and it said that the, the sun never set on the British Empire. All over the globe, no matter where you went, it never set on the British Empire. And now we just read about that in a history book. What Daniel's trying to tell us is that human kingdoms, no matter how impressive or like that chaff, just takes a little bit of wind, and they're blown away. In the time of those kings, Daniel's going to explain what this supernatural rock is. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. All chaff, human kingdoms, broken to pieces on this kingdom that God is going to set up. The great God, Daniel says, my God of Israel, Yahweh, has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, paid him honor, and ordered that the offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. This is the point Daniel's trying to to make with that dream story. And this is where I believe Daniel is trying to, God through Daniel is speaking to us, reminding us of who has access to this wisdom and this power to make sense of the world in which we live and who gives it. And they are both gods. They belong to him and he gives both and he can take it away. The dominion that you have, Nebuchadnezzar, as impressive as, impressive as you think it is, God allowed it to happen. And when you put yourself in place of God, you're going to discover, as we're about to find out in next week's story, you're going to discover not great things happen. God alone has wisdom and power, and both are his to give and take. And as human kingdoms come and go, there is one kingdom that will reign forever. Remember what I said? God's rule and his reign is going to be finally victorious one day. And because of that truth, Daniel is saying to the people who are exiled, Daniel is saying to us, we are kind of living in exile as well. We're part of two different kingdoms. The kingdom in which we find ourselves, we call it America, and the kingdom of God. And if we're going to live out the kingdom of God, God's rule and reign is going to be lived out in our lives Remember these three words are going to come back up again next week. We're going to need courage and confidence, which enable us to live with hope. Because it takes courage to live out what Daniel was living out. He got lavished with all kinds of wonderful things. It doesn't take long for all those wonderful things to disappear when you cross the empire. Next week we'll find out what happens when you cross the empire. We are called to live with courage in this kingdom and confidence that the one who rules and reigns supreme is giving us power, is giving us wisdom to live this life. That one is not the gods of Babylon and not whatever gods we create in our own world, but the God of Israel. 
the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God who broke into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. So oftentimes, as I close here, I want to give you the two responses we shouldn't have and then what I think the right response is. One response is what I was trying to address last week, which is we get so depressed and downtrodden in the fact that it looks like evil's prevailing. And sometimes we forget who rules and reigns supreme and who is victorious. And last week, I was trying to remind us of that. Living in this empire, we shouldn't be broken people. We shouldn't be just trying to muddle through and survive. I said last week, we're called to thrive living in an empire. So that's not the right response, to just be downtrodden and muddle through and say, oh, what can we do about it? Evil's prevailing. Well, hopefully you know that that's not the case, but it's also not the case that we should just say, well, it doesn't matter you know, God's in control, God's going to win, so, you know, who cares? They'll do whatever they're going to do, and, you know, I'll just mind my own business and do my own thing. And Well, I think that's the wrong response, too. I don't see Daniel and his buddies responding and just saying, well, Nebuchadnezzar, God's going to do what he's going to do. No, Daniel gets involved. He goes through three years of training He's taken on all these things and says, nope, I'm not going to eat that food so that you're going to know who's really in charge. And Daniel engages the empire that he is a part of. And God reveals to Nebuchadnezzar and everybody else living that time who the ruler of the world really is. God's kingdom has broken into our world. I hope you remember that. When Jesus came, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. He inaugurated the kingdom of God. He has broken into the kingdom of this world, and everybody thought, hey, we're Rome. Nobody can do anything to us. And God breaks into this human kingdom and reminds them that there is an everlasting kingdom. This supernatural rock that comes through, that is a representation of God's kingdom smashing all the other kingdoms. The thing is that God king, God's kingdom comes in in a different way. You know, in Jesus' day, it was Rome. That was the latest and greatest of human kingdoms. And boy, were they ready for this rock. This, they would have read Daniel, saw the supernatural rock, and God's going to send this Messiah, and he is going to crush Rome. He's going to stamp him out. He's going to kick him out. He's going to smash him to pieces. How did God break into this world and begin his kingdom? With a baby. In some no-name town to two no-name people. What? Apparently, God's kingdom comes in a little bit different way than all the other human kingdoms. Hey, we got the biggest army. We got the most money. We got the most clout. Guess what? Our kingdom's going to rule. And the Messiah of this kingdom, the ruler and reigner of this kingdom, is actually hanging on a cross. And the prince of this world says, see that? You've lost. You are defeated. The one who says he rules the world, who was there in the beginning, there he is, hanging on a cross. But obviously we know that that's not the end. Jesus says, so that you know that God rules and reigns supreme. He walks out of that grave, appears to his disciples. And before he leaves, he tells his disciples, all power and all authority has been given to me. And you're going to take that and you're going to go into the world with it. Now, why does he say that before he leaves? Because in the world in which you and I find ourselves, we might begin to wonder whether or not God does rule and reign supreme. And we might be starting to back off on this whole kingdom of God thing. Because if you're going to stand for the kingdom of God, if you're not going to trade the truth for a lie, it's going to take some courage and confidence and hope on your part. 
the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God breaks in to this kingdom every time you choose, every time you decide to follow him. That, that's as simple as it is. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. This little tiny thing. The kingdom of God is like this little piece of yeast. God's kingdom has broken into this world. And every time somebody bows their knee to the one true God, the one true king at that cross, and believes in Jesus, the rule and reign of God advances a little bit more. That rule and reign begins in small ways. It begins when you walk out. When you walk out of those doors, you live in a different kingdom, and you get to decide whether the kingdom of God is going to rule and reign in my life, and I'm going to advance that or not. And maybe you've been having some hard conversations that takes some courage to say the rule and reign of God is going to advance here in this family, maybe in this church, in this community. Imagine if the rule and reign of God started advancing within your family. Think of what that would look like. What if it happened in an entire church? What if it happened in an entire community? Every time you choose to follow God's ways, you are bringing the kingdom of God. It's as simple as this. We teach our girls, you're not supposed to lie to mommy and daddy. And as wonderful and as cute as they are, guess what? Sometimes they do. And why are we teaching them not to lie? This is part of living in God's kingdom. You know, Jesus says we shouldn't do it. The ways of God are not lying to each other. Because we know that part of God's kingdom is not lying to each other. I don't want my girls to lie to us. I don't want them to lie to their friends. I don't want them to lie to their spouses when they get married. I don't want them to lie to their bosses. And what happens if they're running an entire company? I don't want them to lie to our employees. What if they're running the political office? Where's the rule and reign of God come in when it comes to something as simple and as basic as not telling this little lie? No, when it's just to me and Jess, it's not really that huge of a deal. But when you start doing it to your spouse, what if you lie to your family? What happens when you start lying to your employees or your employer? What happens if God gives you authority and power over other people? And you know what? Lying's really not that big of a deal anymore. When we choose not to lie, just something like that. When we build our life on this kingdom, the rule and reign of God starts to spread. And that's what we're trying to do. When you walk out those doors, you can either throw your hands up in the air or you can do what Daniel did and what I think Daniel's telling us to do. And wherever God has planted you, you can allow the rule and reign of God to happen in your own life, in your own family, and allow that to spread. And as that rain spreads, as the kingdom of God spreads throughout this earth, we'll see the forces of darkness being pushed away. But that only happens when you and I choose, and this is basically what I'm inviting you to do every Sunday. Whatever the message is, when you walk out of those doors, when I walk out of those doors myself with my own family, am I going to allow God's kingdom to reign supreme in my own life? and start pushing back the forces of darkness. Because we're living in a moment, that I've said before, where we're going to have to take a stand on what we believe about truth, about what goodness looks like, about what morality is. We are being pressured. It's going to take courage and confidence to live and hope to live within the empire which you and I find ourselves in. And that only happens if we allow God's kingdom to break into our lives so it might break into the world around us. Let's pray. God, thank you for your words, your truth. Thank you that, God, there is a sure footing that we can step. 
God, your word, we believe, is truth and it has the ability to transform lives. I pray for wisdom to understand, Lord God, that you would give us some revelation into how we are called to live in the empire we find ourselves. God, you are reminding us through Daniel of who you are, that all wisdom comes from you. Our ability to make sense of this world comes from you, and that there is no human kingdom, no matter how impressive, that one day will not be crushed by your everlasting kingdom. God, we have an opportunity to walk out of these doors today, advancing that kingdom by building our life upon your word, your truth, and living with courage and confidence and hope. God, I pray in these challenging times that you would enable us to do that. God, help us to live in such a way that it is clear that your kingdom reigns supreme in our lives, in our families, in our church, so that we might push back the forces of darkness and stand up for what is right and true and good. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.